heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, full earnings coverage ahead. We've got Qualcomm, the shares popping after chipmaker, is providing an upbeat forecast, signaling the mobile phone slump. It's easing. And sticking with smartphones, we'll push ahead to earnings from Apple, which are due to come out after the bell today. And we'll have the latest in the trial of Sam Bankman fried as jurors begin deliberations today. But first, let's check in on these markets and the feel good music after the Federal Reserve and that feeling that the Fed is basically perhaps done with the real fast and furious pace of rate hikes really dials into a desire to buy these stocks, in the t- particularly in the tech space. We're up five straight days on the Nasdaq 100. Best winning streak since we've seen since about August of last year. And indeed, we're seeing S&P 500 having its best day since August on the day. So overall up 1.3%. We're seeing all country world index, basically European stocks pushed higher. So too did Asia. We're having our best day in well, months, it would seem. We're up 1.6% best day on the all country world index since the beginning of the year. And I'm looking at the US 30 year. This, as we see that sort of desire to be buying into bond markets because yields are likely falling because maybe the Federal Reserve doesn't have to keep on hiking into this particular macro economy. We're down some nine basis points on the longer end. We were down much further earlier on today. And have a quick look at what's happening in the world of crypto, because this is an interesting one. The dollar is down because we're not anticipating such a hawkish Fed, but so is Bitcoin. So that just shows that there's really some pulling away from this particular risk asset at the moment. We're off by some 2%. So 34,000 still heading above that all important sort of $34,000 level, but notable that we've got a little bit of caution in that particular space. What are you looking at in the micro? There are many, many technology earnings to pass over. And the first is Peloton. Interesting because they gave a a guidance for revenue for the rest of the year that was pretty weak. They're having trouble converting free users of their app into paid subscribers. They were really down after earnings hit. Now they're up significantly 11%. Growth is coming, they say, and the market clearly buying it. Another P, Palantir, also upgrading its profit outlook for the full year 23, also slightly upgrading its revenue expectations. The story AI. Palantir is an AI story you and I have hit all year long. Now the financials are starting to show that fourth straight quarter of profit also up 18%. Then after market we get Apple. We know what's coming. Fourth straight quarter of sales decline. You have to go back two decades for Apple to have a slump like that. But we get some insight into how the iPhone 15 is doing. So we get about nine days worth of sales in that September quarter. The main one I'm looking at right now is Qualcomm. Forecast for the current period of revenue 9.1 to 9.9 billion dollars. A big range but at the midpoint of that range, you're well above analyst expectations as for sales. The thinking, it signals that things are recovering in the smartphone market. So let's get more on that Qualcomm story and bring in Kunjan Sabani of Bloomberg Intelligence. That's the guidance. What do you read into that, Kunjan, about the smartphone market globally? Thanks, Ed. I mean, coming into the quarter, it was pretty clear that the smartphone market had hit its bottom. Customers have been clearing out inventory for a few weeks now. But what was not clear was what to expect in terms of the speed and size of the market snapback, especially in the Android market in China, which is sort of which was sort of holding back the start of the recovery for Qualcomm. And there was this build-up anxiety around if we are going to have brace for another disappointment. So it was a sigh of relief to see signs of green shoots over there, especially from their better 1Q guidance. And a couple of data points to validate was the 35% sequential revenue growth from the Chinese Android OEMs and them confirming that they will keep the majority share at Samsung 24 launch. Mm. All of this, though, is at a time where Cristiano Amon is trying to diversify away from really the all-in on the mobile space. How is that working? How is that bearing fruit when you're looking at connected devices, when you're looking at automotive, for example? I mean, look, um, the PC is really a call option for them, specifically in terms of street estimates. The numbers right now don't even attribute much revenue coming from this business. And even by Qualcomm's own commentary, they don't expect PC revenue to start contributing significantly until 2025. So the discussion right now around PC is more related to adding to the sentiment around this rather than the fundamentals. The good thing for them, though, is if they have any success, no matter what the size, it will all be upside from the current numbers. 
Kunjan, I want to dig into some of your analysis you published last night, and that's about China. The landscape for smartphones in China has changed in terms of where the chips are coming from and also planning for the future. Based on what Qualcomm told us, what do you read into the Chinese market for that name? Yeah, I mean, again, like I said, it was the one thing that was dragging, uh, holding back the strong recovery like we're seeing in PCs versus not seeing in smartphone. I mean, so there is good signs that the Chinese Android OEMs are now pulling in and building on their inventory. So that's good for Qualcomm. The other factor there is the uncertainty about Huawei possibly gaining share. Um, so we still have to wait and we'll see how this plays out. But right now with them getting Apple back, and again, getting a lot more content in Android OEMs. As long as this market keeps coming back, it's going to be a double tailwind for Qualcomm. Kunjan Savani, we thank you so much for Bloomberg Intelligence and all things Qualcomm and indeed China. Perfect segue therefore into our next discussion because he just mentioned Apple there. He mentioned Huawei. Let's talk about Apple's reporting results after the bell. Here to walk us through what to expect is Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. And Mark, a lot of people anticipating that China is going to play a big role in this set of numbers. I want to really focus in. I wish we had a replay of something Kun Jeong said when he first started the discussion. He noted that the Qualcomm expectation for sales from Chinese handset makers are way up. I was preparing for Apple earnings yesterday, and a headline crossed on the terminal during the Qualcomm earnings that said Chinese phone maker sales connected to Qualcomm are anticipated to be up a third in the current quarter, or they were just up a third. That's good news for Qualcomm. If you think about it, that's not very good news for Apple mm. to answer your question. Obviously, Qualcomm makes a lot of the CPUs and chips that go into Android phones, a lot of the ones developed by Chinese manufacturers. But Apple makes their own chips, right? If Qualcomm sales are going way up in China, the handset makers there, something's got to give, right? So that answers your question, I think, about what's going on with Apple in China. We may be in for a little bit of a dip there because Qualcomm is taking that share from somewhere, right? So I think that's something to look out for, for sure. There's the financials backward looking at what happened in the fiscal quarter just gone. And then you listen to what Tim Cook and Eddie Q will say about the future. The iPhone 15 went on sale September 22nd, right? That gives about nine days of sales in the quarter that they'll book. But in that time, they've raised services prices. We had all those details on the next generation Mac and M3 chips. What moves the needle mark outside of iPhone towards the end of the year and into 24? Yeah, I think it's wearables. I think it's stocking stuffers, potentially like the lower end Apple watches and the AirPods. I think that is going to probably uh, um, result in a lot of the momentum you're going to see from Apple in the holiday quarter. Obviously, the iPhone 15 Pro is going to do exceptionally well. You know, Apple has a pretty easy comp for the iPhone 15, right? This is a redesigned phone, titanium, that new look, that new material, that new three nanometer chip. That's what sells consumers. And the good news for Apple is it doesn't seem that they have any major production hiccups this time around. Last year, you had a minor iPhone update with the iPhone 14, right? You had major shipment delays and major shipment constraints that you don't have this year. So you should see some nice growth on the iPhone despite the situation potentially occurring in China. So I'm looking for positivity for sure on the iPhone. In fact, if you look at Wall Street expectations for uh, the previous quarter, the iPhone is one of the only business from Apple that we're expecting growth in. The other two, and this is very surprising, and given everything we just discussed is greater China. Wall Street is anticipating $2 billion uh, of year-over-year growth in the China business, right? Going from about $15 billion and change to about $17 billion in just that greater China region. So, you know, it appears even if the iPhone does slow down in China, they're, they are going to make up for the iPhone sales in other regions and they're going to make up for the iPhone in China with other products. The Apple Watch is certainly growing in popularity in China. It's become a really big deal there. Even the Mac, Right, these higher priced, more luxurious Macs, those are becoming bigger sellers in China. So no, no matter what's happening to the iPhone, I think based on what Wall Street is saying, that they are gonna make up for it still. We want to thank you, Mark Gurman. All things Apple as we anticipate those numbers after the bell. Meanwhile, coming up, look, Canadian e-commerce firm Shopify, talking earnings there too, beating estimates for the third quarter, shares they rally hard, a conversation with the president, Harley Finkelstein, that's coming up next. This is Bloomberg Technology.
Discipline, cost cutting, that's just one of the factors that helped Shopify see positive results in their third quarter. The Canadian-based e-commerce platform Shopify says its report showcased the durability of its business model. Revenue, earnings per share, they beat estimates and then some. Joining us now on how the strategy is playing out, Harley Finkelstein, president of Shopify. And look, clearly investors love the numbers today. We're seeing the shares rally hard, Harley. How sustainable is that, that level of discipline, but also showing growth into the next fiscal quarter? Yeah. Thanks for having me on the show, uh, Caroline and Ed. Look, we laid out a very deliberate vision to balance both operational ambition, which we certainly have a lot of, but also the financial discipline. And the results speak for themselves. We are delivering top line growth and profitability. Q3 GMV, which of course is the proxy for how well the merchants are doing on Shopify, was up 22% to 56 billion. Revenue was up to 25% up to 1.7 billion. And as you pointed out, uh, we have cash flow of north of 270 million. Now, with every quarter ticking up, that cash flow is a percentage of revenue and Q4 is expected to keep this trend going. One of the other things that I don't think is getting covered but is very exciting to us is that more of the largest and most important brands on the planet are joining Shopify, like Ted Baker and Tom's and LVMH's Pucci and Quicksilver and, and Billabong. And it's it's a really great, uh, for, for us, it's a great story, but it's a story of balancing both growth and profitability simultaneously. And that's because we have a new shape of the company, which is far more focused on our main quest and things that are most important. Uh, Harley, on that new shape and those brands that you're talking about, how much of that focuses into the outlook? There's an accusation out there from some on the street that you guys are a little bit conservative with the outlook and maybe you could do a bit more. Yeah. Well, look, uh, I, I think we are, as a company, firing up all cylinders, both horizontally and vertically. On the vertical side, obviously, Shopify is known to be the entrepreneurship company, the place where millions of small businesses go to start uh, businesses and grow those businesses. But we also have this incredible effort around enterprise commerce, whereby some of the largest companies, some of the, those I mentioned, but you know, companies like, like Spanx, for example, and Glossier, for example, and the Mars Company, for example, and Black & Decker all come into Shopify as well. At the same time, one of the other metrics that we really think a lot about is our product attach rate. And that really is a proxy for the usage of our products and platform by our merchants. That's over 3%. So that means more merchants are taking more of our products, whether that's things like capital or shipping or payments or even audiences, for example. We like that. We like being the center of the business for these millions of stores. And you managed to persuade bigger players and keep the smaller players at the same time as increasing pricing. I'm interested in how you are thinking about monetization going forward, Harley. Yeah. Monetization is something that we, we uh, certainly in the last year and a half or so have been spending a lot more time thinking about. I've been at Shopify now for uh, over a third of my life, almost 14 years now, uh, and we really never changed pricing. We, we made our first change last year to our basic plan, which most merchants are using. We increased it by about a third, by about 33 percent, and we saw very little pushback. And that sort of suggests to us that the value to cost ratio of Shopify is so far on the side of value. And so as we think about you know changing pricing across other products or even other plans, Plans. We're really, we want to be deliberate about it, but we believe that we still have an opportunity to increase pricing in the future. Harley, quickly, what's the AI story here for Shopify? Yeah. Well, look, I think we are actually uniquely positioned to harness the power of AI. We think that particularly small business and entrepreneurs will really benefit from these tools. But unlike other generative AI products, uh, our AI product, which is called Shopify Magic, one, it's designed specifically uh, for commerce and retail. But also, it's not just one feature, one product. What we've done is we've embedded it across all of our features and all of our workflows so that more people can start businesses and more people can be a lot more successful. And, uh, and merchants are finding it to be really valuable. They spend more time making their products and less time doing some of the administrative tasks, which, frankly, AI is really good at. Harley Finkelstein, president of Shopify. Always great to catch up. Thank you. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Cara, quick check in on the markets. And as you know, this week we're checking in on the European close, given the time difference. The Stock 600 Europe, which is our main gauge of European equities, on track for a fourth straight gain or has closed now and hit a fourth straight day of gains, which is its longest streak of wins going back to July. A lot of the trading was around what was happening with the Fed last night, even though that's a different jurisdiction. Also, the BOE, the Bank of England, keeping rates uh, unchanged and really talking down the prospect of further cuts. We just heard, of course, on Bloomberg Television, our interview with the Bank of England's governor. This is what the FTSE 100 looks like, up 1.4% on the day. Uh, the sterling GBP USD up two tenths of 4%, and UK 10-year yield suffer a little bit, 11 basis points, 4.38%. One more day in the week will bring you that European market close 
update. Caroline. Meanwhile, let's just check in on how the US is performing. And I have to say it was rallying in the UK and we've been rallying worldwide today on the back of well, macro policy, the Federal Reserve, of course, looking like it's done, perhaps with its really hawkish viewpoint on where rates have to go. Nasdaq up 1.3%. I'm shining a light on what on earth is happening with Peloton because, of course, it is, you know, a volatile stock nowadays, only worth $5 when you're looking at its per share price point. $12, a 12% rally when we had been sinking hard after their numbers. This is all as really they actually managed to beat in their fiscal first quarter when it comes to revenue, when it comes to EBITDA, when it comes to margin. But there was a slightly weak look ahead in terms of signaling what Bernstein is saying, basically zero growth. So there's a bear narrative there. However, the first quarter, margin, first quarter margins were particularly strong, says Bernstein. Nevertheless, Canaccord Genuity, for example, that particular analyst downgrading the stock to a price target of five versus eight dollars and cuts from a hold to a hold from a buy. So interesting narrative coming from Peloton. Bitcoin under pressure today, even with the dollar weaker. So interesting selling of that particular risk asset. Ed. All right, another earnings one we're watching, Airbnb. Let's bring in more, uh, get more with Bloomberg's Natalie Lung. And Natalie, I'm looking at shares. We're down more than 3%. This is the story of the world economy catching up with Airbnb a little bit in terms of the outlook that they gave us. Yes, uh, so in their fourth uh fourth quarter outlook statement, they mentioned they saw some early volatility in the quarter. Um, on the earnings call, they mentioned it was hard to pinpoint what exactly it was, but they pointed it to you know, macro uh, economic factors as well as geopolitical tensions. Lastly, we sit here in New York, and what's been so interesting is the regulatory pressure that mm -hmm. Airbnb is coming under in this particular city. Mm -hmm. Do they speak to that narrative, just how much the business model is kind of being upended at the moment? Right. Uh, their take is that New York is like a smaller market right now for them, like around 1% of the revenue before the regulations kicked in. And they, their take is that over 80% of their top markets have been regulated. So they're still confident that with their business model with supply of the listing still growing at a double digit rate. What was interesting also about Airbnb and its leadership was they didn't have to sort of make those painful announcements of job cuts when everyone else was. They managed to steer the business, remain lean. Are they going to have to think about that a little bit more with macroeconomic headwinds, with geopolitical tensions, with the odd regulatory headwind here in the US? Right. Uh, a lot of analysts uh, who have, um, it's, Sarah rating is at the highest number uh, right now and a lot of them are looking for long-term growth uh, catalysts mm. um, and this is why they are coming up with product updates to try to make the platform more reliable getting hosts to continue hosting with them and also guests to continue booking with them so the response is really key here you know the pandemic era the behavior of consumers has changed stays of 28 days or more in focus but next week we think we're going to get all kinds of new products what does the future look like for Airbnb Natalie right um, CEO Brian Chesky says they're laying the foundation for a lot of the new services that are coming out, um, whether it's uh, using AI as a better matching service. Um, all, all these updates are to, you know, tell guests and hosts to keep, you know, booking and using their platforms. We'll keep an eye on how those product announcements do transpire. Natalie Lung, we thank you for the inside track on Airbnb. Meanwhile, we've got more on earnings. Etsy, of course, came out. We want to bring in Poonam Goyal from Bloomberg Intelligence. And Poonam, I'm so fascinated with Etsy's numbers because we just spoke with the president of Shopify, feeling very resilient about where a consumer is, managing to beat and, and really show a path to growth. Why is Etsy not managing to mimic that sort of consumer strength? I think it's a, it's a little bit of a different story because we are seeing consumer spending slow down. Consumers are making trade-offs. So I think it's about more where are you finding what you want. We saw good results out of Amazon. So you can't say that the consumer is down everywhere. But I think with Etsy, you know, when you think of Etsy, you think about gift giving, right? You think about what can you get that's unique and different. But Etsy offers so much more than that that there just isn't awareness for. So I think it's about them continuing to build that awareness that's going to get more buyers onto the platform. They saw a really nice increase in sellers in the quarter. They were up about 19%, which is encouraging. So people want to sell on Etsy. Small businesses want to sell on Etsy, but they still need the buyer growth. We need to see more buyer growth. We need to see buyers want different things from Etsy, not just the gifts. Poonam, I was reading your outlook on Etsy last night, and one of the things you talk about is something Caroline and I have discussed with every e-commerce company in the world, which is personalization. Why will that help them address the issues you just outlined? 
Because when you go online, you have an endless aisle. You go to a store, you walk the aisle where you know you'll find what you want. But when you go online, the list goes on and on and on forever. So the ability to personalize for any company and really give the consumer more of what they want than just everything is going to help drive conversion. Online conversion is just low single digits. So people browse more online than they buy and the ability to personalize, the ability to cater to their needs is really going to help drive that conversion higher. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of amazed that people don't realize the breadth of things you can get on Etsy. I'm just thinking, our producer's reminding us of, of the Taylor Swift and the Beyonce getting your glitter and your silver ahead of time. Everyone was turning to an Etsy at that particular moment. I think of how much Halloween must be a push forward for, for makers on Etsy. What do you think, what do you want to see from leadership here, basically to market themselves? I think they need to just invest in marketing. They need to get the word out there that Etsy has a lot more. You know, think about the home category that they talked about. We are seeing people invest back in their homes. You know, they took a pause after the pandemic, but now you're thinking, you know, can I upgrade something in my home because it's too expensive to upgrade out of my home into a new one? So you're seeing stuff like that plan and Etsy sells a lot of home, but that's not where you go for your home stuff right now. You go to Wayfair, you go to Amazon, you go to Target, Walmart, etc. Interesting, Etsy saying that shoppers are focused on essentials, less on discretionary. That's the macro impact. Poonam Goyle, love speaking with you. Thank you from Bloomberg Thank Intelligence. You. Meanwhile, coming up, we'll get the latest from the trial of one Sam Bankman Freed. Jurors, they're beginning their deliberations today. We're going to be joined by Blockchain Association CEO Krista Smith about, well, the overall impact on the crypto space, Ed. Yep, more earnings as well. PayPal is a mover to the upside. Boosted its profit outlook. Remember, this is the first earnings that Alex Chris is overseeing as CEO. But they announced a new CFO, uh, uh, Jamie Miller, who joins from Ernst & Young. They also received a subpoena from mm. the SEC relating to their work in dollar-denominated stablecoin. And in the regulatory filing, say they're complying with the SEC. So that's going to be a story to track, which shares up almost 5%. This is Bloomberg Technology. With the FTX trial now wrapped up, jurors are beginning deliberation on Sam Bankman-Fried's fate right now, today. What does it mean for the crypto industry? What does it mean for Sam Bankman-Fried? That's bringing Kristen Smith, CEO of the Blockchain Association, for kind of the bigger picture on what's going on here. But first of all, okay, the jury is away deliberating. Yes. The closing argument from... Sam Bankman Fried's attorney was that he has been painted unjustifiably so as a villain. And Bloomberg has this piece today that there were six opportunities where he was given a choice tell the truth or double down. And the prosecution says he doubled down. What do you make of all of that? Yeah, I mean, I think the evidence is incredibly compelling. It seemed that every time Sam got in trouble, instead of confronting that trouble, he was like a gambler in Vegas and ended up doubling down again. And unfortunately, he was apparently getting that money from customer funds. So, you know, very um, interesting, I think, a dramatic trial. I'm very curious to see what verdict the jury returns. It sounds like some speculate that could happen even as soon as today. But, you know, I think from the crypto industry perspective, we're very eager to see this chapter closed. We feel like people are unfairly conflating the entire industry with one man and one company, when really this is a story about a crook, not a story about crypto. And so we're excited to move forward. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly been an entertaining and interesting trial, something I think they'll make movies on. Well, uh, this is very much an innocent until proven guilty situation. It is a jury trial after all. But in the event of either outcome, has this series been damaging to the goals of the blockchain association because you essentially want um, the, the underlying technology that supports crypto to be mainstream globally. Yes, yes, absolutely. And we're trying to get public policymakers in Washington to understand the technology so that we can get the appropriate regulatory framework in place. And I think absolutely without question, this case and this trial has been damaging to the industry. I think the good news, though, is in the past year since these events went down, we have seen leaders across the crypto industry from other leading companies. We've seen entrepreneurs. We've seen individual members of the community. Community. They've really taken an interest in working in Washington and talking with policymakers. And so what used to be just sort of Sam Bankman-Fried going around and 
taking up a lot of the time. That has been replaced with a much broader, more diverse set of individuals in the crypto ecosystem. And those that actually have the right values that are building things that believe in the power of decentralization. And they aren't just here to uh, make, make a bunch of money so they can give it away. At least that's uh, Sam's stated motive. Some of the voices that are now speaking to regulators, well, one of them might be over at PayPal at the moment. We understand, of course, that the SEC is is looking into their view on stable coins in particular. How are you seeing that sort of discussion bear out at the moment? We know that Gary Gensler is pretty, well, cynical, shall we say, about the space. But what are the other people in the room at the moment saying? Yeah, no, um, that's an interesting question, Caroline. I mean, we don't know a whole lot about what the SEC is asking PayPal about its new stable coin business. Um, only that they are asking questions, so it's a little bit unclear. You know, typically the SEC does not have jurisdiction over stable coins because stable coins are not securities. Um, mm-hmm. But what we, we are seeing right now is a lot of discussion on Capitol Hill about what is the right regulatory framework for stable coins. Both in the Trump administration and in the Biden administration, we had reports from the president's working group that recommended ideas for a regulatory framework. This summer, we saw Patrick McHenry pass a bill through his committee that would provide a regulatory framework for stable coins. And I do think there's a very good chance that before, perhaps not the end of this year, but before the end of this Congress, that we do see stable coin legislation move forward, because this is an issue that everyone agrees needs to be addressed. But it's not the role of Gary Gensler to regulate stable coins. He's a securities regulator, and stable coins are not securities. Well, he'll debate that. CF, the CFPB, <laughs> the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, also overlooking these sorts of movements from big companies towards accessing crypto at large by a consumer base. What about the ETFs con- conversation as well? I mean, ultimately, that's what's sort of been driving Bitcoin, the OG of the crypto space. Yeah. Are we anticipating as soon as this end of this year that we will get a spot Bitcoin ETF? And how much do you think that will be liked or loathed when we still have this slightly cloud over the whole space. Yeah, no, I mean, I think we're already starting to see some price action in the markets on anticipation of a Bitcoin ETF. Um, you know, we had a very important moment over the summer where the SEC lost a case that it acted in an arbitrary and capricious manner by not moving forward with a spot Bitcoin ETF, you know, much thanks to Grayscale and their legal team for all of the hard work that they put in to get to get that ruling. And so I think we what we have now are multiple applications. These applications have deadlines where the SEC has an opportunity to extend them, but most of these deadlines are coming up in January. So I think it's um, highly likely in the next couple of months that we will get a Bitcoin spot, uh, a spot Bitcoin ETF approved. And I think that there are a lot of investors that are eager to be able to access um, exposure to Bitcoin through their typical brokerage uh, platform. There was one tangible example of blockchain technology used out of London this morning, HSBC. Mm. Frankly, one of the biggest bullion banks in the world using distribution distributed ledger, excuse me, to to prove that tokenizing ownership of gold works. Did you see that? And if so, how does that make you feel as a Um, real world example? I didn't see that particular story, but I know there are a lot of people looking right now to figure out how can we tie these real world assets to blockchains because they can be an incredibly um, efficient way for uh, tracking information. And so the key kind of becomes how do you connect that asset, the digital asset to the real world asset? But there are a lot of people that are exploring, exploring this place right now. And I think there are a lot of opportunities for upgrading the infrastructure, uh, for tracking a lot of things we do in uh, the traditional investment space. A lot of people still talking about that underlying technology. Blockchain Association CEO, Kristen Smith, thank you so much for joining us on this day. Meanwhile, Ed, you're sticking with crypto. Yeah, we got some news sticking with crypto sentiment around Coinbase, which is rising with the long anticipated debut of a Bitcoin ETF appearing imminent. This has been fueling expectations for a widespread increase in demand and prompting some investors to disregard the uncertainty, which we've been talking about surrounding the largest U.S. crypto exchange, even as the SEC lawsuit filed earlier this year continues to cloud Coinbase's outlook. Time for Talking Tech. And first up, Intuit is winding down personal finance app Mint and pushing users to shift to Credit Karma, a similar service that the company acquired in 2020. Mint will no longer be available at the start of 2024 and its team and product features are being moved within Credit Karma. 
And Google's vice president of search testified about the company's AI efforts at the Justice Department's antitrust trial against the search giant and disputed suggestions that the company rushed to release its AI chatbot Bard earlier this year in order to beat Microsoft's offering. Plus, the UK summit on AI safety is wrapping up with AI leaders debating over how much to focus on the sus- supposed existential risks of AI, highlighting those broader tensions in the tech community as lawmakers propose regulation and safeguards. Prime Minister Sunit, uh, Rishi Sunak will be leading talks on the final day of the, uh, of the summit before a conversation with Elon Musk later today. Gosh, that was a lot to take on board. Caroline. <laughs> um, let's get more from the AI summit. Mark Bergen joins us now from London. And there has been this tension about immediate threats of AI versus long term. And many there trying to say, look, it's not actually about the risks, it's about the models that are in development and analyzing where they go in the next year. But ultimately, what are some of the takeaways from this summit? What have they actually progressed on? I mean, one of the major takeaways we saw yesterday, the uh, a speech from the Commer- U.S. Commerce Secretary, followed by a vice minister of, of China sharing the same stage, mm. uh, agreeing on very broad terms um, what the kind of the, that all the countries put out around uh, these catastrophic harms. Uh, but at least that's a symbolic and sort of diplomatic Uh, victory here for the UK and for the summit. Um, The fact that they could bring together the US and China uh, where they have clearly disparate views on the geopolitics involved with AI and the the US and certainly has has talked about uh, China's AI development as being this sort of military threat. It's interesting. We're, we're going to debate a little bit more about who was there and, and whether or not they were being mobbed or not. It seems as though there's some talk that one Elon Musk was mobbed and he held court with delegates, but also in other times was sitting and listening and taking all in some of the discussions around AI and, and the control of AI. How, how has basically the corporate side of the conversation gone, Mark? Uh, it's funny you mentioned Elon. I mean, he's certainly like a. The UK has put him out as a as a interesting figurehead and sort of the, the shining big CEO that they got. I mean, it, there's a debatable. Certainly, his companies involve artificial intelligence, uh, but he's definitely not one of the the leaders building these large language models that we're all paying attention to. And that, frankly, is sort of this frontier AI that the conference is meant to be about. And then we saw, you know, the, the benefit here is they get the the Elon Halo uh, attached to that and a lot of attention. Um, yes. And then the side is that the, you know, the, the other side of Elon is his tweet that he put out, I think it was less than an hour ago, right? This sort mm. of cartoon uh, that was, I, I only interpreted uh, as a criticism of, of the conference itself. Well, uh, Musk tweeting a meme, shock. Uh, <laughs> there is some mechanics of things to come this evening. Musk and Prime Minister Sunak, just quickly walk us through what we're expecting. Uh, I mean, you know, Elon has talked a lot about sort of what we what we've paraphrased as, as the doom doomsayer version of AI, right? The existential risk. Um, the he was one of the notable signatories on this letter earlier this year about slowing down the advancement. Um, I do, and be very curious to see. You know, one of the conversations that's, that's happening kind of on the fringes of the event, and even at the event itself, Meta has made this, this claim. This, their chief scientist, and then we had a really fascinating interview with with Google's DeepMind's Demis about this idea that there's this regulatory capture that the big biggest companies are basically saying regulate us and only us so the smaller companies can't compete. Uh, and I, I imagine that Elon will have and certainly have an opinion on that yeah. um, and, and probably likely uh, I would say that, that there is some regulatory capture involved. Mark Bergen, I'm sure you'll be tuning in to some of those conversations going on on X in a minute. And we thank Mark. And Ed, meanwhile, we've got news relating to Musk's other ventures, right? Yeah, and also via a social media post, Starlink, the space-based internet service offered by SpaceX, has hit cash flow break-even, according to Elon Musk, the world's richest man. And SpaceX CEO posted the financial update to his social media platform X, formerly known as Swiss. He also shares that Starlink has launched a majority of all the satellites cumulatively from Earth by next year, Cara. And this just shows the progress they've made. But investors want to know, A, are they going to make money on Starlink? Apparently so. When will they spin it off in an IPO? And still, what, the most valuable private company out there? Big time. Yeah, still the most valuable. And we've been reporting based on these tender rounds, the valuation edging above 150 billion, which is crazy. Quite a lot. Meanwhile, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology Air.
We have the podcast wherever you get your podcast on all the Bloomberg platforms, but also on Apple, Spotify, and iHeart. We really appreciate all of you that listen in. From New York and SF, this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.